All right, hey everyone, welcome to uh, a new day and a new session in our intro to Biblical Hebrew. We're, we're getting near the end of the, the course, at least kind of through our first half of the year through Hebrew. And the topics we've got today um, are in some ways a bit of a, uh, a mixture of things we've looked at before. But by looking at a handful of different things, we'll be able to, to build into our knowledge in a few different areas in the Hebrew sentence. So the biggest thing on the docket for today is carrying on some unfinished business with pronominal suffixes. And now we're going to look at um, how those are used when they're, they're joined with some inseparable prepositions, which is a really old topic for us in some ways, uh, but now bringing a couple of things together. We'll talk around some things about syntax and function in a sentence um, uh, of those items. We'll also look at a couple of other things that relate to verbal clauses. One of them being uh, what we'll start to see more of are, are weak verbs. What happens when we have a guttural in one of our positions uh, of our trilateral roots for a verb? We'll see that that will require a few changes along some expected patterns for um, what we know for gutturals to do with reduced vowels and, and the like. And then lastly, we'll also touch on um, a word that we've looked at, I think, once before in our vocab list, that relative pronoun, a share. And we'll see that that pronoun uh, is a way of really building clauses or building sentences. And we'll see more and more of that quite commonly in uh, Biblical Hebrew. So that's what's on the, uh, the agenda for today. So why don't we have a look at some of these forms and see if we can't add to our knowledge. Well, why don't we start out with a table? Uh, this table will be our, our foundation for the, uh, this chapter in many ways. In uh, a few weeks ago, what we looked at was another table that had to do with those IPPs. Remember those independent personal pronouns? That was our who and he. Remember our, our, our who means he and the he is a she. All of those little rules uh, and memory tips we, we looked at for remembering that table of IPPs. Now there, those independent personal pronouns, it was really important we recall that those only will, will only ever relate to the subject of a sentence. Here, we're getting a very different situation. If a pronoun needs to be the object of a phrase or a sentence, then it will be joined to inseparable prepositions. Now, the prepositions we're talking about are le, remember to, for, or against, or b. That was our word for in, with, or by. We learned one more preposition along with these. Uh, it was k, but this preposition will not uh, take the form of, of pronouns that we're seeing right here. Um, it it has its own pattern, so don't don't include that for the time being. For now, we're talking about is l and b, and these will only ever relate to the object in a sentence. So what we're seeing here on all these forms um, are endings. All of these endings that are attached to in this example uh, the pronoun l. Now, we could exchange this with the pronoun b and make almost the same table. So my advice would be to recognize these endings, but memorize them uh, in the context of having a pronoun or a preposition attached to it. That might make it easier. Once we see that, what we're seeing is, is uh, really a handful of endings. Some of them might look familiar from our, our um, look at verbs even, as well as from some of those pro independent personal pronouns. So why don't we just walk through these and see what we're dealing with to see perhaps some of the common things that are happening on some of these forms. So from the top, let's just say this whole paradigm through a few times and then look at it internally. So from the top, the three, MS, uh, three masculine singular. Lo, la, Lecha, lach, li. So again, that was lo, la, lecha, lach, li. From the top on the plural side, we have lahem, lahen, lachem, lachen, lanu. One more time, we have lahem, lahen, lachem, lachen, lanu. So that's how it sounds. Uh, as you can see, all of the translations are uh, to him, to her, to you. Uh, we could also say for him, for her, for you. What we're getting there again is our prepositions with our pronouns are attached onto them here. Now a few changes that we see. We are used to seeing uh, a, a shiva underneath um, our pronoun le. But what we're seeing is that uh, disappears or changes in a few different places. So um, let's look at some examples. What we're seeing here in the third masculine singular, lo, that becomes a, a, uh, an open syllable, C, V. 
Therefore, our, um, our Shiva, under this form, uh, disappears. You might notice something similar, in fact, happening down on uh, this side of the paradigm. Because here, uh, we get effectively an, another open syllable, C-V, and that becomes Li. In both of those cases, the Shiva will, will not be required because we're changing the way that the syllable is constructed. A few other things that we see happening here while we're on the topic of, of syllables, you'll notice that um, if we can change our color here, that on these uh, forms, we have a comets. We have a comets, and what's happening there is these syllables are, are taking a comets in what would be um, a CVC situation. Here we, we've said we're used to seeing a, a long comets in an open syllable, but these are becoming uh, closed syllables, so they're pronounced la and lach. That's what's happening there. That's occasioning a change. Now where we see, uh, I guess, the only place in our table where the, um, where the uh, shiva is retained is in our 2MSG, lecha. And there we have um, uh, the, the initial syllable, if we were to car carve it up this way, is, um, has a vocal shiva, and the second syllable, cha, is an open syllable, C-V. So there's a few things that might look differently for us. Now on the other side of the equation, if we uh, look at what's happening here, we have comets the whole way down. So expect to see that there, uh, and if we pay attention to the way the syllables are, are broken up there, it's something that's not terribly different from the, uh, what we saw on the um, uh, other side of the equation. All of these uh, are heavier endings. Uh, for the first four forms, those are all C, V, C. Um, the, the hem, the hen, the hen, the hen. And then in this last form, we have a C, V with a vocalic ending, nu. And because of that, we'll have a, an accent. Now, that's just walking through some of the things on this form. There's probably even more detail than we need to get into at this point. But by looking at this, uh, my advice would be just to, to make a flashcard of this uh, entire paradigm, run through it a few times, lo, la, lecha, lecha, li, um, and just get to know the way it sounds and get used to hearing um, what these endings are. I wanted to at least show a few things that are going on within the, um, the changes to the vocalization because we're used to seeing the pronouns or the prepositions rather in this form with an inseparable preposition. So the big things here are uh, these will always relate to an object. They will always be uh, attached to l or b. And depending on the ending, we might see some changes to the vocalization. But other than that, uh, it should be relatively straightforward. In this chapter, we also have uh, a few small words, a few small words that uh, are important to get a handle on for communicating that something either exists uh, or does not exist. And the way I remember this is uh, with this kind of Shakespearean metaphor of to be or not to be, that famous line. Um, in Hebrew, we have a number of what we could call particles, small words that fulfill a certain function in a sentence. And these two particles are used to uh, express existence or non-existence. Now, the first one that we could look at uh, is, I guess, here we could say yesh, yesh. That's our form, uh, our particle for existence, to say there is something or there are something. Uh, the, we see that in the form yesh, as well as in a second we'll see our example. That can be um, also show up as a form yesh, uh, joined here with a makef. Yesh or yesh, we will see, uh, and lock that in as a vocabulary item to to mean there is or there are something. Now on the other side of the coin we have an, um, a particle of non-existence. Ain. Ain, or as we see in our example down here, can also show up in this form, ayin. Ain or ayin uh, is a way of saying that something does not exist, so there is not or there are not. Now to translate that into English we need to provide that verb is or are. So the glosses I would suggest would be for yesh, um, there is, there are, or ain, there is not, or there are not. Now, where our inseparable prepositions and pronominal suffixes come into the equation um, is on this point here. These two forms, yesh and ain, may be used in tandem with one of these um, suffixed pronoun or suffixed forms of l to show something, uh, to show possession of something. Uh, and Ross goes through this in a bit more detail in our, our, our grammar, so I won't give some examples here, but 
Um, the one he gives, the bottom of page 109, I think is a helpful one just to, to see an example of that. Uh, so if you flip there, you'll see he writes, Yesh li isha. And the literal translation of that would be, there is, yesh, to me, li, isha, a wife. There is to me a wife. What that's expressing, though, is possession. I have a wife. Um, he gives a few more examples of that, and that's kind of the tie into what we just looked at on the previous slide. But we will see this quite often without that possessive aspect. So I wanted to give um, one example of each of these in a context of a passage that we've, um, w at least one of these passages we've seen already in our reading so far, to see how it works. So let's look at the, um, the negative particle, uh, or the particle of non-existence, and we'll see some of that here in Genesis 2.5. So this passage reads as, uh, as follows. The Adam ayin la avor et ha adama. The Adam ayin la avor et ha adama. Now, if we translate through this, we would be able to get most of these forms. Uh, we have a man and a man uh, to work or to till. We know this is now our um, definite direct object marker et ha adama. Uh, a man to till the ground. The new component for us here is this. And there was no man to till the ground. While we don't have that verb to be here, we need to supply it here um, based off of our particle of non-existence. There is not or there was not. And there was no man to till the ground. Again, this is that view of creation where there's a great understanding of potential but no action. Uh, and it's the impetus for creating human, humankind. So on the grammatical item, the new thing for today is that form, ayin. Let's look at the next example below. And this comes from that um, kind of getting into the Joseph novel, Joseph novella in, in Genesis, where there's uh, famine in the land and they need to move to Egypt. Uh, and then we read this line. Uh, Genesis 42, 2 says this. Hene shemati ki yesh shever bemitzrayin. Hene shemati so we can see a number of forms we recognize in here already. Hene, um, behold, see, uh, or my favorite, look, buddy. Uh, Hene, behold, see, so you're drawing attention. Shamati, this by now we should be able to recognize is a cow perfect verb. Um, I have heard, shama, to hear. Ki, um, this is our, our, our word we'll translate here as, as there. Now, a few words you might not recognize this next cluster. Shever is grain. Bemitzrayim, uh, in Egypt. So, so far we could translate this as, uh, Behold, I have heard that grain in Egypt. But the, the item we need to translate to make sense of this is, Yes, there is. So the translation then would become, Behold, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. And what we're getting there is that statement of existence, yesh, to say that there is grain. Uh, it does exist. It is down in Egypt. So two little words that we're dealing with here um, that can show up in either these forms here, uh, ain or yesh, or these forms here, ayin or yesh. And what we're seeing there is um, what's probably our first uh, set of particles that function in a sentence to express a larger meaning here. Uh, to be or not to be. Something exists or it does not exist. All right, now we're on to our last few items in the chapter. Uh, the one item we're not going to get to here, I thought we could look at this briefly together in class, was our, our perfect tense third aleph verb. So read closely over chapter or section 13.4 on page 110 uh, and get a sense of the few things that are going on in that um, paradigm. It's not an entirely new paradigm. It's based on our Cal Perfect. Um, and if you can get a handle on what are the one or two things to know there, um, the things that change, then we can talk about those briefly in class. But since we're talking about new forms, um, the one new item I did want to touch on is this relative pronoun. Um, this is a word we've touched on once or twice or seen a few times before, but it's worth looking at again. Now in Hebrew, we will use um, the form asher um, to indicate uh, a relative clause in a sentence. Now, this will be the form we'll see most of the time. Uh, however, we may also see um, this form, she. 
uh, a shortened form of this relative uh, pronoun. She will sh appear mostly in poetic um, sections. I think it's around 139 times in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, you'll see this in the book of Psalms, and it will be joined directly to uh, the word that follows. But for the most part, what we'll see is asher, though don't be thrown by at times if you see this word she, uh, meaning the same thing. We'll translate that as who, which, or that. Now this would be another chance we could kind of revisit some of our um, high school grammar, perhaps. If we were to do this, uh, we'd have to ask, well, what is a relative pronoun? Well, what is a relative clause? What is a main clause? Now, if we were going to look at this, um, uh, we'll go right to left just because we're dealing with Hebrew. If we have a main clause here, and we have a relative clause here, in English we use a relative pronoun uh, in the same way to show that the relative clause is extending something, it's qualifying something, it's elaborating something, it's giving something that's parenthetical to the main clause. So if our main clause was um, the tree, uh, and our relative clause was uh, in the middle of the garden, for example, then we would need to include the word that to show how the two indicate. So we could say in our main clause, the tree, that is in the middle of the garden. That relative clause is specifying something about that main clause. So that's what we mean by a relative clause, and that's what we mean by... Um, a, a relative pronoun, even in English we use a pronoun, the pronouns who, whom, which, that, to show the linkage between a main clause and a relative clause. So that's our English grammar. Uh, in Hebrew we will plug in uh, either of these forms in this position uh, here to show that we need uh, to show our relative pronoun. So why don't we look at um, just a few, ex or just one example, rather, of what that uh, can look like. Ross gives us a few in the textbook. Here's one um, that I thought we could, could use to indi indicate this relationship and show one example of our relative pronoun. So let's work, look at the Hebrew. Hamelech asher bechartem. Hamelech asher bechartem. Okay, so what we have here... Uh, is our, our, our familiar word, Hamelech, the king. Um, the, the form at the end is, uh, uh, is our, our cal perfect, um, that you chose, you chose, Bachar. This verb here, Bachar, means to choose. Now, what we're getting in the middle here, uh, this form, is our relative, uh, our relative pronoun. And we're translating that here as, as whom. So if we do the same thing as we saw, uh, did above, the king would be our, our main clause, if you will, and then our relative clause would be you chose, with whom, that relative pronoun being the linkage between them, the king, uh, the king whom you chose, or if we're going to do it in Hebrew, it would be um, back this way, because we're going in the opposite direction. So in Hebrew, that word asher will be very important to us, very common, um, that relative pronoun will, will show up to show the linkage between a main clause and a relative clause. And that relative clause could be introducing a, a number of different types of information, but it will refer back to that antecedent, either a pronoun or a phrase in the main clause. So in this chapter, we've looked at a few new things um, and a few old things. We've looked again at pronominal suffixes, only here now putting them together with b and l. Uh, we said a word or two on the syntax there. We looked at those two new particles, yesh and ain, uh, those to be or not to be um, particles, and now the relative pronoun, a share. One of the things we're going to start to see in, in biblical Hebrew, and the same would be in biblical Greek, is we learn a whole lot about verbs, a whole lot of, uh, about vocabulary, a lot of big picture things in the sentence, but it's often these little tiny words, these particles or prepositions, that we get, um, we get meaning out of because they show relationships between larger sections in the sentence. So have a close read over through these, have a look through the workbook, and we'll pick up on a new topic next day.